Framtíðarbók Gjöf til framtíðar Kápi Banki Vafalítið þeir hægt að fullirða að Milton Friedman sé þekktasti hagfræðingu sem nú er uppi. Friedman var lengi kennari við háskólanni Chicago. Hann öllaðist heimsfræg þá er í 1976 er honum voru veitt Nobelsvelunin í hagfræði en þau fekk hann meðal annars fyrir rannsókni sínar á nýsluhegðun og peningamaksþróun. Ef til vill á Friedman almennafræð sína meira þakka frjálsíki stjórnmálaskóðunum sínum en hagfræði en frjálsíki stjórnmálaskóðunum sínar hefur hann sett fram í bókum og sjónvarnstáttum en hluti sjónvarnstáttana var sýndur hér í íslenska sjónvarpinu fyrir nokkrum árum. Jafnframt því að vera frægur er Friedman og mjög umdeildur og sýnist sitt hverjum um ágæti þeirrar efnahagstefnu sem fyllt hefur verið í löndum og borð við Chile og af stjórnum Thatchers í Bretlandi og Reykans í Bandaríkjónum en Friedman og kenningar hans hafa haft veruleg áhrif á stefnu stjórnenda þessara landa. Um alla þessa þætti munum við ræða við Friedman í kvöld og umræðurnar munum fara fram á ensku. To discuss Friedman's theories, policies and field questions tonight, we have three men who have been or are university teachers. Birgir Björn Sigrjónsson at the Economics Department of the University of Stockholm, Olafur Ragnar Grimsson at the University of Iceland in the Department of Political Science and Stefan Olafsson also at the University of Iceland in uh, the Department of Sociology. The rules of the engagement are that we would like you to be as brief as possible so we can cover as much, much as possible. But before we open, the, uh, open up for general discussion and questions, I would like to ask you, Professor Friedman, to give us a brief outline uh, of you, what you see as uh, the ideal society, your personal utopia, if you would like. <laughs> Well, my personal utopia is one which takes the individual, or the family, if you will, as the key element in society. I would like to see a society in which individuals have the maximum freedom to pursue their own objectives in whichever direction they wish, so long as they don't interfere with the rights of others to do the same thing. In such a society, I believe you do need a government, but the government has a very limited role. Its role should be to provide for the national defense, to provide for protecting one individual from coercion by other individuals, and finally to provide a mechanism whereby we can formulate the rules that will govern us, the rules that decide what we regard as private property, what we regard as the rights of individuals, uh, legislative process, and as part of that, a mechanism for judging differences of opinion. So you would have essentially in my good society a very limited government devoted to the tasks of defense, of justice, of legislating rules, and very little else. Mm -hmm. The rest would be left to the free individual activities of individuals joined together through the operation of a private and competitive market. At the moment we, we have, uh, uh, in your opinion, I guess anyway, too big a government and uh, very far uh, from uh, the ideal society which you have described. Which would be the best way to attain, to realize that dream? There is only one effective way to do so, and that is by democratic means, by allowing the people to express their views. I have been fascinated by the fact that in country after country you have a paradox. You have what is supposed to be a government of the majority. You have a representative government. And yet that government repeatedly does things that a majority of the people oppose. You go around in the United States, for example, where I know the situation best, and you will find that a majority of the people in the United States think government is spending too much, imposing taxes that are too high, and would like to see government cut back. At the same time, the representatives of the people through the parliament through what we call the Congress, you call the Parliament, uh, follow policies which lead to those results that the majority deplore. The reason for that, I believe, is that between Britain and the United States, which has not been involved in this, so let me emphasize that we're talking about a very small part 
of a very big book. Right. Yes, I know that. Brief, uh, brief comment, or shall we carry on well, to the political? Uh, my point was that uh, this type of transforming data from annual data to face data was a novelty, was a new thing no. when it was done. Well, okay, it was not the regular thing. I beg and, your pardon. And, 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 and my second point is that you choose the periodization of the model on the grounds of the monetary data, or no. don't you? No. Or by some other method. No. But, but that is no. pretty subjective. No. Method. No, no, you're it, quite wrong. The periodization, the problem of breaking it down into the cycle, was pioneered by the National Bureau of Economic Research by Wesley Mitchell and Arthur Burns in a book that was published in the 1930s. The National Bureau, for decades, carried on a series of business cycles in various fields in which the concept of separating out the cyclical from the non-cyclical uh, was a major part of it. There are dozens of books based on that technology. The dates we use for periodizing the data were the so-called reference dates chosen by the National Bureau of Economic Research on not the basis of a broad series of figures. They were not dates that we chose from the monetary figures at all. Good. Right, okay. 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 Stefan, you haven't participated in the discussion, uh, and no okay. doubt that you're willing and eager to take part. Yes, Professor Friedman, I'd like to uh, take up some of the more political aspects of your theory. Okay. Uh, one of the main themes of your many books is uh, the criticism of the role of government in Western society. And uh, this comes up in uh, various uh, books, various works, in, in relation to various issues. And uh, you give many reasons for this criticism. Uh, one of the general reasons is that uh, the bigger the government is, or the public sector, um, the more inefficient will the economy be, the lower rates of economic growth and lower levels of living will follow. Uh, when today we uh, look at the empirical facts and compare societies in the Western world, uh, we find that uh, there are many exceptions to this. And uh, uh, we have cases of societies in Europe where you have a very big government governments which have taken a big share of the national income through taxes and duties and redistribute this again through the society and also where you have more government regulation of the economy. Uh, I could mention, to, to keep this concrete, mention one society in Norway, which is uh, close by here. In Norway, the government takes in about 50% of the national income uh, for redistribution, spends it on schools, hospitals, uh, old age pensions, and so on. Uh, in the, the United States, the government takes, for similar purposes, about 30%, just over 30%. A little more than that. Uh, more than that. Yes, just over. Uh, it's been increasing recently. Well, if you take local and state governments, it's over. It's about 35 percent. Yes, but uh, the, the, the state government is uh, around about the 30 percent. Yeah, uh, the main issue is that this is a big difference. It's almost uh, twice the, the, the size of the public sector in Norway is, is a little less than twice that of the United States. But uh, unlike what we would expect from your uh, theory, Norway has actually done much better than the United States in economic growth rates recently. Uh, even if we take a longer period, like the, the period from 1960. This would seem to fly in the face of your theory. Let me go back uh, on several points. In the first place, I would like to stress that I have written two kinds of works. I have been involved in two kinds of things. One class of work has been scientific primarily concerned with the scientific issues. Books like the monetary history of the United States, books like the monetary trends that we were just mm. talking about, book like a theory of the consumption function. Those books are not about politics. Those books do not involve any political policy. In some cases, they do involve criticism of particular government episodes. For example, in our monetary history of the United States, I think we demonstrate very greatly that the Great Depression in the United States was largely a result of bad monetary policy by the Federal Reserve. But that's not a, that's a historical observation about what actually went on. On the other hand, I have written a set of books of which Capitalism and Freedom, Free to Choose, 
the tyranny of the status quo, all of which in association with my wife, are explicitly political. So that I regard my interest in politics as an avocation, not a vocation. I am primarily an econo economic scientist, I hope, and I think you will look long and hard in any of my scientific books to find the proposition you, found, you stated. It isn't in there. There's not a single word in any of those books that deals with the question of whether a big government is good, bad, or indifferent. That subject I have dealt with in the works which I regard as sure. political. Okay, now let's turn to that. But that's a correct reading of the political uh, works. That's a correct don't? reading yes. of the political works. I'm not questioning that. I'm just trying to make the distinction. Yes. Because <laughs> I think it's very easy for people to confuse the two and not sure, to recognize sure. that si Perhaps see, I there's should a broad science of economics, Perhaps which I should is non-political. I should explain to you. Some of your, some of your Take the monetary theory. Mm -hmm. well, I just wanted to say that some of your followers in this country deliberately try to confuse your scientific criteria with... Well, they're not here at the moment no. to answer for themselves. <laughs> in which they sent students to Chicago to be trained. We sent people down there to help them in providing their education. And as a result, we trained at the University of Chicago many highly skilled economists yeah. who well, played an important well, I, I part know that. I in know economic that. policy. Yeah. In I the second place, in 1975, I spent exactly seven days in Chile giving a series of lectures. You will be interested to know that one of those lectures was entitled The Fragility of Freedom and dealt with precisely the threat to freedom from a centralized military government. Yeah, no, but uh, you will also point. like to know that aside from those seven days which I spent in Chile at that time, I have had no connection with the Chile government. I have never been an advisor to the Chile government. I have, if, if a friend of mine drinks or smokes, I think he's making a mistake. I will try to persuade him not to do it. But I don't think I have the right but you to are, force him not no, to do it. Right. So I am on moral grounds opposed to the uh, opposed to pro prohibition. However, also, I go on to say you're also opposed that those to moral grounds are reinforced by the pragmatic grounds that trying to prohibit it doesn't work. You're also right. opposed to free to, 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 to,